Alright, I think you get the point by now, so this is a compilation of book reviews, part two. This is the introduction song. It's not very good, but it's not too long. First up, I'm going to talk about Beastly. Now, I think most of you are probably semi-familiar with Beastly because you saw, or at least have heard of, the movie that came out that was made off of it. It had Vanessa Hudgens and Alex Pettifer in it. And the movie's awful, obviously. And a few weeks ago, I was uh, looking around and I saw that the book has sequels. And I thought, oh, okay, those will be hilariously bad. And so, I had never read the book before, so I got that, and I got the two sequels, and I read through the first book, and while there were some parts that were, like, just laughably awful, I looked up the meaning of Kyle online, and that clinched it. Kyle means handsome. I wasn't. I found a name that means ugly. Theo. Who would name their kid that? But finally settled on Adrian, which means dark one. That was me. The dark one. Everyone, by which I mean Magda and Will, called me Adrian now. I was darkness. Like, that passage is... that's a work of art, okay? That deserves to be displayed alongside The Last Supper, or the Taj Mahal, or Hannah John Common. It's just... too beautiful for human eyes. Overall, it's, like... it's fine. You know, it's a cute romance. It's not too horrendous in most ways. Like, you do really feel bad for, uh, the main character, Kyle, who... If, if you didn't know, Beastly is a rendition, a modern rendition of Beauty and the Beast, so Kyle is, like, the beast. He gets turned into this animal-like thing. And, you know, you feel bad for him a little bit, even though he is kind of a dick, and you see him turn into a much better person over the course of the story. Um... Yeah, it's just, it's fine. Like, I could probably spend more time making fun of it, but the... I, what's the point? And then I did go into the sequel book, and I read about 75 pages of it, and it was definitely worse than Beastly, but it still wasn't awful. It was just kind of boring. There wasn't much in there that was hilariously bad or anything. And I was a little disappointed by that, because I was hoping it would be like another elixir where I can make this, you know, giant video just picking apart everything and it would be a lot of fun, but it, it just really isn't even that. It's just... The, the sequels are just kind of dull, they're not my thing. The first book is perfectly fine though, so if you're just looking for a cute romance, go ahead, check check that one out, whatever. Okay, that, the camera angle felt a little awkward there, but... Okay, whatever. So, next up is Article 5, and that one I read a couple of months ago. Uh, that was like right after I read Malazan, so I was I was just on the lookout for something simpler and easier to put together that would take a lot less energy to read, you know? And so I read a couple of uh, young adult things. And Article 5, like, I really wanted to like it, okay? It's one of those uh, dystopian, like, Hunger Games knockoffs. You know, you know what I'm talking about. There were tons of them all over the place uh, a couple of years ago. And that one stood out just a little bit, though, because the main character is uh, Ember. And... She is just this teenage girl who's living in the United States as it is becoming more and more of a dictatorship. And one day, uh, her and her mother are arrested and sent away because one of the uh, new laws that they've put in place is that children cannot be born out of wedlock, and Amber was born out of wedlock, and her mom was unmarried, so they sent them to two separate uh, re-education camps. And then the majority of the story is just Ember escaping from the camp and then trying to escape the country. And the thing about that is that it's immediately different than a lot of its fellows, because in most of those it's just like, hey, let's have a rebellion, cool. Whereas this one, it's like much more small scale. It's just a couple of characters saying, we need to try and escape. And in addition to that, it actually is saying something about our modern-day world. It's actually saying something about our society, because the uh, world that they're in, it's a horrible dictatorship, like I said, and there's constant war going on. We don't get a lot of detail about the wars, about why the war is happening, uh, but inside the United States we can see that an extreme form of religion has taken hold. It's like they've gone back to an extremist uh, Christian worldview. And so, yeah, the author is actually pointing at something and saying, hey, if we're not careful, 
this can be bad. And so, wh whereas a lot of the other ones are just like, hey, society is structured weird, doesn't that kind of suck? This one actually is saying something. But beyond that, there's just... There's just not much in this book. Like, it's Ember, she falls in love with a cute soldier boy who helps her escape. Uh, they go out of the education camp, they go try and find her mom, they're going on a road trip, and... It's just... there's not much there, you know? And Ember is kind of a, an annoying, stupid bitch for a huge portion of the book as well. Like, at first she was fine because, like, you feel really bad for her, and you do know that she she remembers before things got this bad, and uh, you do get a sense of what, of how normal people live under this system. And it, when she's in the re-education camp, she is actually planning her escape, and she's trying to figure out, like, okay, how do I deal with this without losing my mind? You know, that, that sort of thing. And so at first she's fine, but once they're on the road trip, she's just dead weight, up until the very end. Like, the climax, she actually does some stuff, so that's better, but still, it's like, she's just an obnoxious character, so, and from what I understand, the sequels go into much more traditional territory, where it's just like, hey, these two are trying to help out a rebellion now, and it's just, eh. it, it's, it's just kind of dumb at that point. So, I will probably never read the sequels, my head canon is just that Ember and her friends got away, and they lived the rest of their lives in Canada, and then eventually the American regime just collapsed in on itself, um, yeah, but I, I really wanted to like this one, but it just made too many missteps, so I couldn't quite get there. Next we have Inheritance, which is the final book in the Inheritance Cycle, which started with Aragon. And the thing about Inheritance is that I've seen it get a lot of flack over the years for being, like, a crappy ending. Like, people didn't like it. They thought it was trash. They... it's, it's just been trashed a lot. And... Honestly, I never understood why, exactly. I guess I can get what, how the romance between Aragon and Arya never really materialized, and a lot of people were hoping for that. But, well, I was fine with it. You know, it kind of makes sense how it would go that way, and I appreciate that it was doing something different. You know, Arya is, like, over 100 years older than Aragon, and he's only, like, 16, I think, at this point. So, to her, that's, like like, a toddler being in love with her, or in love with her, as it would seem from her perspective, so that makes sense. A lot of people were kind of disappointed with the way they defeated Galbatorix, so uh, I thought it was really creative, you know, rather than just being more powerful than this dude, or finding this one secret weakness, they just did something creative. Uh, and I think a lot of people were just hoping for a more upbeat ending than what we got, because what we got was a bit of a downer, you know, but like I mentioned in my, uh, villains video, the damage Galbatorix did doesn't go away just because... just because he died, you know? So, overall, I thought that the way this looked at the, uh, reconstruction of Alagasia and the way things were gonna change going forward, I, I thought that was a much more mature way of looking at it than most other books aimed at this age range will get. And, uh, beyond that, I just thought a lot of the battles and stuff were cool. You know, the final confrontation with Galbatorix and all that, that was... That, that was cool. So, yeah, I, I don't have much else to say about it. I just think that Inheritance was pretty good as a finale to a relatively big epic series. Next is the Legend Trilogy by Marie Lu, and the, I'm looking at all three books here. And this is another one of those kind of dystopian Hunger Games knockoffs, but it actually does some different stuff. I read these a couple of years ago. It was before I started this channel, and I had... I guess I had more patience for that sort of thing at the time. But basically, it follows two characters, one named Day and one named June. And they live in a post-apocalyptic world in uh, the Republic of America, which is like the western chunk of the United States. And that is, as always, a horrible authoritarian dictatorial regime where normal people live in horrifying poverty and all their freedoms are suppressed and, you know, life is pretty miserable for the majority of the population. And Day is a wanted criminal who faked his death a while ago and now he goes around just kind of making trouble. Uh, and I'll get to that a little bit more in a minute. And June is a, uh, like a star student, I guess you'd say. Her 
older brother is in the military and he's very well respected in the officer corps. And then one day he's murdered and they think Day did it, so June goes hunting for him. And over the course of that, obviously they fall in love, okay? Like, you're just, you're not going to have this sort of story without them falling in love. And whatever, I'm not going to talk about that too much. Um, and beyond that, they, June starts to see more and more of the darker side of her government, and she realizes, you know what, maybe I should be resisting this, maybe I shouldn't just be helping this along, you know, that sort of thing. And then in the second and third books that deals with much more in-depth, like, how do we change this uh, system. And it's not just a rebellion is the thing. That's actually one huge positive that I would put in this book's favor, is that uh, without getting too deep into spoiler territory, near the second and third books, in the second and third books, uh, things seem to look like they're going to reform uh, on their own, without too much bloodshed, without too much violence. And I think that's great, because, one, that's just a realistic way of looking at things, because we see in this government not everybody who is in there is, you know, straight up evil. Some of them actually do want to do good, and they do want to uh, fix things and make things better for the average person, so that's pretty great. Uh, and then, in the latter part of the series, like in the climax, it gets back into, like, war and fighting and the main characters have to, you know, solve things, so in that regard, it's a little bit... I, I don't want to say cliched, because it is doing it in a different way, and I don't want to... I don't want to harp on it too much as well, because it's trying something a little bit different, and I always want to be forgiving about things that at least take a risk, you know? And, uh, the, the main thing, though, about the series that I didn't like was the climax, because, you know, it just goes back into, like, more fighting and all that, and, uh, Day apparently has a brain tumor, which is going to kill him very soon, but he can still, like, run and do parkour like an expert, and it, it's just kind of dumb. And, uh, None of the characters ever really face consequences for the things they do in the f final chapters of the book. Like, they commit war crimes, and they even mention, like, yeah, this is a war crime, we're gonna get arrested if this ever gets out. And it gets out, but they never face any consequences for it, so... Th it goes out with more of a fizzle than anything. And overall, I would just say the series is fine. You know, nothing spectacular, but it's, it's fine. And I don't know if I can really recommend it to anybody, unless the idea of, like, seeing a story from two different perspectives, from the person being hunted and the one doing the hunting in this world, which is, admittedly, it is better put together than most of these dystopian YA worlds are. Like, the Republic of America feels a lot like a fictional version of North Korea in, in the best way possible. It actually feels like a real place you could go. So, yeah, that's good. Other than that, like, I don't know if I can recommend it unless you're really looking for something up that alley. So then we have The Young Elites, which was also written by Marie Lu. And, okay, so I reviewed the first book in this series about a year and a half ago. And just like Legend, I just said it was fine. You know, there was not much in there worth celebrating, but there wasn't much in there worth attacking either. You know, it was just fine, you know? Uh, the only two things that I would say were actually genuinely really good were uh, the villain, Terran Santoro, who I mentioned in my top ten villains list, and he is genuinely fantastic. And number two was the climax of the first book, because it ends in such a way where I was really taken by surprise, and I was like, wow, that's... I wasn't expecting that. That was, that was some crazy stuff. And uh, then in the second and third books, it goes in a much different direction than I would have expected. So... Okay, I, I liked it. So the story of this one is that it's like a medieval fantasy world, and a while before the story starts, this thing called the Blood Fever goes through the world and kills tons and tons of people, uh, but some of the people who get infected don't die, and in fact they actually get powers afterwards, including the main character, Adelina. And uh, she tries to run away from home to avoid being sold off by her father, but... Uh, he catches her, she accidentally kills him, and then she's about to get burned at the stake by the, the Inquisition and by Terran because she's, you know, an abomination, demons, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but then she gets saved by the prince of her country, who also has powers, and he tells her, hey, 
my sister stole my throne, help me get it back, and you, you get to live, and she's like, okay, cool. And so the majority of the first book is just them trying to get that back. But then, once you get into the second book, it's Adelina saying, like, you know what, I'm tired of everybody's shit, I don't want to just help others out, I want to take this throne for myself. And then, without giving too much away, the story goes in a much darker direction, and it goes uh, much more into uh, Adelina's psyche. And then the third book, it's kind of shifts focus again, and it's all about, like, okay, there's a greater threat now, let's set aside this fighting and try and save the world. And I think that they all float into one another fairly well, and I think that Adelina is a good enough main character to hold things together, and Taryn is definitely a good enough villain to hold things together. Uh, overall, just like with Legend, only to a greater extent, I have to give it props for at least trying different stuff. Because I was really expecting the whole series to just be about them trying to take back the throne and give it to the prince, but no, it, it, it changes uh, focus a couple times, it goes in directions I wasn't expecting, and it, it does stuff I hadn't really seen before. So even if it doesn't work 100% of the time, I, I gotta give it credit for trying something different. And the, the worst part of the series by a pretty big margin is the actual prose of it, though, because most of it is Adelina's first-person perspective, and it's told in present tense as well. Which, I think present tense works fine when it's first-person, but then it switches to other characters third-person, and it's still present tense, and it just feels really, really awkward, and it's difficult to keep track of things, and I just... Yeah, I, I didn't like it, but... Uh, basically, I just want to say that after reading the majority of Marie's Lu Marie Lou's published works, I gotta say, I think she's being held back by writing in Young Adult, because a lot of her ideas could be much better explored by an older audience, I think, or if she was writing for an older audience, and if she had a bigger page count, because Adelina in The Young Elites kind of starts going crazy at one point, but it's just treated so... I don't know, it, it's, it's shown to you so bluntly, I guess, where she's like literally hearing voices that are telling her to do bad things, and that also kind of takes away from the impact of Adelina doing bad things because, well, it kind of gives her an out. It's, it's like, whoa, whoa, the, the voices told her to do it. You know, she's, she's just crazy. She can't help it. Whereas a lot of the other times it actually goes into like her abusive childhood and why she would feel, why she would not want to feel powerless like this. So it makes more sense. And I, I just feel like stuff like that could be much better explored in a longer fantasy series that was aimed at an older audience. Then we have Railhead which is something that I've really never ever heard talked about, it, and I can see why. It's not terrible, but it's just not... It's not much of anything, really. The, the setting of this one is kind of interesting. It's like, humans have, you know, colonized a bunch of planets and stuff, but rather than getting between them using space travel, they have these, uh, gates, which, you know, t they're, they're like wormholes, they teleport you from one place to another, and uh, in order to get through the gates, you have to be on these, like, specially designed trains, which, they, they're, the trains are kind of weird because the way they make them, they're kind of alive, and they all have personalities and stuff. And so, you know, when you're going around, the trains will be talking, and they, some of them will be, like, sadistic and want to kill people. Some of them will just be really nice and friendly. It's, it's kind of bizarre. And also, beyond that, the whole of human space is actually controlled by a group of artificial intelligences which exist in uh, the future version of the internet. And I mean, that's... both of those are really cool ideas. And then we have the main character, who's a guy named Zen, and he is... I, he's just kind of an asshole, you know? Like, uh, he's a petty thief who, like, rides the rails, goes around to different planets, steals stuff, and then comes back home to live off of it. And he doesn't do this because, like, he's forced to or anything. He's not an orphan. He is, you know, very poor, but he has opportunities to get a job. He just really doesn't want to because he finds this lifestyle much more exciting and much more, uh, rewarding, I guess. So right off the bat, we have a setting and a main character that are really, really interesting and unique. But the thing is that the book never really goes all in on any of that. Like, Zen, for example, as the story goes on, 
he just kind of turns into a good guy later on. And I'm not saying that somebody turning into a better person can't be a compelling character arc, because it certainly can, but the thing is that I liked Zen at the beginning because he was kind of a dick. You know, he wasn't an awful person, he was just kind of a dick. Like, it, it would be like if they tried to make a, a third Deadpool movie, and in that movie Deadpool decided, oh, you know what, I don't want to kill people anymore, I want to go around and help people, and then he stops making such dark jokes and all that. Like, okay, maybe it's nice to see him become a better person, but you would be losing out on all the stuff that made him a good character to begin with. And same with the, uh, with, like, the government structure and the setting of this world is that they never go all in with it, you know? It's just kind of like the AI are really just in the background and they you they tell other people what to do. So the real face of everything is an emperor and it, it's just, like, it, it's missed potential, you know? And there is one character in here who is really, really interesting. His name is uh, Raven and he's really cool, but I don't think he's going to play a role in this series going forward, because I know there are sequels to this, but I don't know if I'm ever going to read them. So, overall, it's fine, I guess? Like, no, no, that's it. It's, it's fine. Maximum Ride Forever. So, I talked about this one in, uh, in my The Rise and Fall of Maximum Ride video, and I'm not going to go into super deep detail here, because I feel like I've already said enough there, but basically Maximum Ride Forever is the final book in the Maximum Ride series, and what I do want to say is that while this is a bad ending, it's better than it could have been. Because originally the series was going to end with Angel, which was book 7, and then it was going to end with Nevermore, which was book 8, and then it Maximum Ride Forever came out, and that's for real the last one. And the thing is, if it had ended with Angel or Nevermore, there still would have been a lot of plot threads that hadn't been wrapped up properly. Whereas, with Maximum Ride Forever, once I got to the end, it was bad, but I wasn't wondering, like, well, wait, what happened to that guy? Or, what did those people wind up doing? Or, what happened to this place? Like, we knew. We had all the answers to that. So, that was not... I don't want to say satisfying, but, like, it's much better than it could have been. The only other thing I will say about this book is that... At the end of the last one, the world got destroyed because the heroes failed to save it. And so this one is showing them deal with the consequences of that failure. And that, that is a ballsy move on James Patterson's part. I'll, get, I'll give him that. Uh, the, the issue with it, like I said in my other video, is that like it's, uh, it, it makes all their struggles before this seem kind of pointless, though, because they spent many books trying to save the world. And so it just, I don't know, it, it does, it's a double-edged sword there, but, you know, it, it did, it did something right, and it did wrap up the whole story, so I guess it, it could have been a lot worse, but it's still pretty bad. And finally, I want to talk about the cheerleaders. Now, I did bring this one up in my response to Elliot Brooks' video not that long ago, and... I'm not going to get into details here because I don't want to get demonetized here too, but basically it deals with some really, really dark, dark stuff that teenagers sometimes have to put up with, and it's, uh, it's not treated with kid gloves. I'll, I'll say that. It, it's treated very respectfully, very maturely, and it, it did make me extremely angry while reading, but it also gave me a new perspective by the end. I was thinking like, wow, that's... That's, uh, that's something. So the plot to this, if you didn't know, is basically just that there's a teenage girl named Monica who, five years before the story starts, uh, a bunch of cheerleaders all died at uh, her high school, there were, including her older sister. There were two of them that died in a car crash, two of them were murdered, and her sister committed suicide. And she discovers some evidence that says, like, hey, maybe these were all connected, and maybe the police got something wrong when they were investigating, so the story is just her going over the mystery of what happened. And, like I said, a lot of dark stuff. That's the main reason that I love this book so much, because I did give it, you know, five stars. And even with the five stars, I will admit that there are issues. Like, every book that I love that much is going to have issues like that. 
And in this case, the mystery really isn't that good. I mean, I've read worse, but like, the reveal of what's going on is kind of cheesy, but also kind of like sad and realistic, and you're thinking, oh man, that, I guess that's how life works sometimes. There are a couple of little tiny details throughout the book that are inconsistent. Like, for example, at one point there's a character who's mentioned to be uh, 24, but then later they say he's 27. And that's not a huge deal on its own, but this is a mystery story, and when you're writing a mystery, everything has to line up perfectly, because every little detail could be important, and every little detail could be the one that makes the reader go, aha, and figure out what's going on. And so, yeah, little inconsistencies like that are a huge, huge problem in a mystery story. But, I mean, at the end of the day, I'm not going to be looking back on that. I'm going to be looking back at, like, the character of Monica and how she dealt with a lot of nasty shit that was thrown her way, and how she grew up, and how looking at that gave me a different perspective on stuff that happened in my own life. And, well, obviously that's not going to be the same for everybody. You know, like, at the end of the day, all reviews are opinion, obviously, but still. Like, this one, I guess if it sounds like a fun mystery to you, maybe not fun, but if the idea of murder mystery kind of appeals to you, go ahead and check it out. It's it's it, it, it's fine in that regard, but if it doesn't, then I don't know if the rest will appeal to you more as much as it did to me. So that's all for today. Uh, there will probably be a part three at some point. I don't know if there'll be a part four, because like, I have a long list of stuff I want to get to, but I don't know if it's long enough for part four. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. But, you know, thanks for watching. Thanks to all my patrons, including Abhiraj Singh, Aepo Sevalainen, uh, Christopher Hawkin, David Martinez, Joseph Pendergraft, and Melanie Austin, and all the others whose names you see here. You guys are great. Thanks to everyone else who watched. I think I, I, think I already said that. Whatever. Uh, please continue watching. Like, comments, blah, blah, blah. Bye.